spread the fire welcome back to smwx and didn't i tell you that the fire was only set to continue i am joined by academic extraordinaire <laughs> um dr stembile mbete one of the finest minds commentating on and analyzing south african politics around thanks for coming to smwx thank you very much for inviting me this is like so cool <laughs> well it's it just, just got cooler <laughs> Oh, wow. What an election we have on our hands. Eh? I mean... Yeah, it's hard to keep up <laughs> with everything. Um, mm. And it's, I mean, one of the things is that it's been an election cycle where the ordinary political news cycle has also just continued. Mm. And so you've got, because normally it's almost as if ordinary everyday politics is almost suspended mm. during an election time um but we haven't really had that this year so hmm. you've had all the dramas of escom of uh service delivery issues all tied up with the election cycle hmm. um and it is also i think the most uh contested election we've had in 25 years hmm. in many ways where um I don't think it's necessarily competitive in that I don't think that the outcome of the election will be dramatically surprising. Mm. But certainly it is an election where there is, you know, people aren't really committed to anyone, mm. you know, or fewer people are committed to a particular party or a particular line. So you're getting the sense that political parties feel like they're needing to do a lot more convincing mm. Um, mm. than they otherwise would be doing. And so there's a lot of contestation and you're seeing that in, in the rhetoric. And then of course we've got all, and the other way that you see that is with just how many parties are contesting yeah, it's this like election. Yeah, 50 or something. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I heard a former IEC um, deputy Terry Tilani is speaking mm, mm. earlier today and he was saying that it's probably going to take longer to count this election mm. because there's so many more political parties. And so you're going to need to go through a much greater process mm. of making sure that the votes are properly allocated. Oh my word, can you imagine those um, three days or whatever it's going to be? Yeah, so he said he thinks it might go to four, oh, even really? five days. Oh, so where. Whereas um, normally if the election, the election happens on a Wednesday and by Saturday mm. uh, you've had some sort of declaration of yeah, the yeah. result. Uh, but he said we might expect it on Sunday late uh, if it takes mm. longer to, to, to count. You know what I was thinking, like literally the other day, when, when you live in South Africa, certain things just hit you at mm. certain times. And I just thought about how much we have been through as a country in the last five years <laughs> like in some ways there's so much happening as you say in the election cycle that you can just forget last week and just write everything that happened before then off but if you just like take a moment to think about everything that's happened since the last election to this one it's it's hard to imagine a more crazy just it's, it's hard to imagine more spiti piti, basically. Exactly. More spiti piti. You know, even, <laughs> even the word spiti piti has taken, <laughs> it, it developed its political <laughs> meaning in the past five years. Um, but I think, you know, in some ways we're another country mm. from what we were in 2014. Um, and certainly from what we were in 2009. Mm. Um, and definitely from what we were in 2004, I think that there's been a great loss of, of innocence mm. um, of the country as a whole, a lot of cynicism that set in, uh, but also this realization that there aren't any politicians really that you can trust in mm. the sense of being on our own mm. really as a citizenry. And so when you are now going through the exercise of deciding who you're going to vote for and then actually voting, a lot of people that I've spoken to have said that it's almost like you're choosing the least worst option. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and the idea that, the, that voting, that elections can be a way of fulfilling dreams or achieving some big vision mm. 
we're not talking vision really in this election. We're not saying, you know, what kind of South Africa do we want to live in or political parties aren't promising us big things about major changes in the way in which we organize ourselves in society or mm. the way the economy is organized or anything. It's we're not going to be corrupt. <laughs> you mm. know, yeah. we've it's really the mundane, the what we previously would have thought of as well. Obviously, that's what political parties are supposed to do. Mm. Um, but that has really fallen into question um, in, mm. in the past few years. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that we're a far less innocent electorate than yeah. we were five years ago. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think we're certainly a battled, hardened bunch after, after just the, the trauma mm. in many ways of, mm. I mean, in general, South African life is, is quite traumatic, but the last five years have seen such upheaval and such change that... Yeah, you're quite right. Like the whole tone of this election is quite different in its ambition to mm. lots of elections before. And I wanted to pick your brain on one theme that surrounded this election, which is, you know, the theme of, of good people and bad people, angels and, and mm. devils. And I mean, feel free to, to disagree completely. But just this, on the one hand, I think last year there was a tremendous naivety around the new dawn mm -hmm. and um, President Ramaphosa. That, that really took me by surprise because I was like, are we really doing this again? Yeah. Like, um, and it seems to me that the momentum of that is not what it, what it once was, but there is still this, this sense in which we might be saved by some outcome mm -hmm. or other in this election. Mm -hmm. um, how do you reflect on, on that theme that has sort of pervaded a lot of what's happened in this election? I think in many ways, South Africans often like to think that we live in a cowboy movie, you know, with very <laughs> simple good guys and very simple bad guys. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, or, or in some way, you know, or that we live in like the Gospels of the Bible, you know, with there's, a, there's an evangelical... Mm. Um, slant to the way that we think of our politics. Mm. And so the mm. idea mm. of having a messiah um, that will conquer evil and, you know, forgive yeah. our sins. And descend and from the clouds. Yes, is, is very strong. It's a strong impulse, I think, in, in the way in which South Africans think about politics mm. across the board. So mm. across political allegiance, across race, across class, mm. um, across education levels. And... We certainly saw that last year with, with Ramaphoria, right? Mm. This, and I think it's because we had framed what had come before. Jacob Zuma became the ultimate bad guy, mm. you mm. know, the nemesis of the whole country. Um, and so this idea that you would vanquish him, mm. Mm. Uh, that it would be possible to do so, and then start fresh, you know, mm. ride off into the sunset and would be lovely and then you start a, a new dawn. Um, and sure, that was so much poetry. Uh, <laughs> just like, yeah. I know what our one minute clip is. <laughs> um, but it doesn't work that way. Mm. Um, mm. Politics are complex. The people that were with Jacob Zuma, including the current president, mm. while he was doing the bad guy things, mm. are still there. Um, Jacob Zuma himself, there was no shootout and then he died. <laughs> he's still there and he's still in the active. Movie. <laughs> in the cowboy movie, he's still active in our politics. Mm, mm, um, and many of the people that were framed as the good guys mm. actually have quite problematic histories themselves and sure. have been... Um, not very kind to civil society in general or mm. to or mm. to the media um, and so our whole framing of our political life as good versus bad mm. um, is problematic and I think it's one of the reasons why we go through these dramatic highs and Absolutely. lows as a country um, and sometimes you're madly positive and happy and then 
the next day mm. everything is complete devastation mm. and look i don't think i think the news cycle definitely contributes to that and the way in which our media frames um and to be honest i think the way in which many political analysts i know i've fallen foul of this myself frame um political events and how we explain things and so we often explain things without context mm. uh, without historical context but also without um, context of our environment right like yeah. what does this mean what is what are other southern african countries going through what mm. are other african countries going through what's going on with democracy in the rest of the world mm. and because of that we tend to then live on these extremes so to to what extent do you think that events in this election mirror other events that are happening around the world right now and in what in what ways do you think our elections are still relatively unique well one of the things is that this is a year of elections globally mm, mm. um there are elections happening all over the european union for example in including the european union elections which are taking place in may um they are by the end of 2020 every sadic country will have had an election mm. there's six country sadic countries having elections this year um including namibia um and uh, and zambia um and so we're not so it's an election -y, yeah the elections mm. happening all over the african continent mm. um nigeria, nigeria drc, DRC mm. senegal is coming up um and so it's a year of a lot of the indian election is coming up mm. so it's a year of a lot of elections uh, across the world and so there's democracies being tested mm. Uh, mm. across the world and what we've known what we've seen since 2016 um well the mark that's used for it is 2016 with brexit and the election of donald trump but the democracy seems to be in a little bit of you know crisis and being contested all over the world um and so even when there has been an election a democratic election people are not always electing democrats so uh, the election of bolsonaro in brazil who is a fascist and mm. quite proudly so um or of right wing uh, government in austria for example um when people are voting and what we've always thought of as democracy which is this process of voting isn't always leading to what we would assume and what we would call democratic outcomes in that it doesn't always represent uh, the will or the interests of the majority of of people and it doesn't always represent the outcome that will lead to the fulfillment of the rights and the freedoms of a vast majority of people mm. within a particular country and that i think is uh it's a particularly interesting phenomenon i think of this part time of the 21st century um and that we're seeing all over the world i think that what is interesting about the south african election is how we are seeing the anc as a liberation movement uh as a dominant party declining but not quite dying that the ANC yeah. in some ways has received new life that's the thing uh, yeah that, that 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 has been quite surprising for me because i think in other parts of the world you're seeing long standing incumbents actually falling mm -hmm. you know um and even where someone like trump emerges within a traditional party it is almost as a sort of hostile takeover mm. of very traditional mm. party forces DRC we've seen a change yeah. over in India more recently but in South Africa it feels to me like we're kind of in some ways bucking this trend to the extent that the incumbent seems relatively robust despite um constant crisis um within our politics and yeah and i think that part of the reason for that is that political contestation within the country has been internalized within the anc mm. and so we're actually seeing a fascinating election within the anc mm. where it does it's not clear from day to day 
which faction of the ANC is actually in charge mm. um, and which faction of the ANC people want to vote for or is actually going to win the election. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's a lot of... And so the ANC is a lot of our, inter, of our national politics is playing out within mm, this political mm. party. And what I find fascinating is that people, instead of rejecting that, mm. um, are seemingly leaning towards keeping the ANC in power for some stability and then saying, well, mm. we can deal with the other politics later. Yeah. Um, and I'm not convinced that's the best oh strategy. Goodness, yeah. <laughs> like, for example, what happens after this election within the ANC? Like, because people seem to be just assuming, and, and I've heard this argument so many times, and I'm just like, this makes no sense to me. But if Ramaphosa is given a mandate, he will somehow have more power within the ANC, and somehow the entire half of the ANC that sort of has opposed him will just disappear into thin air within five years. And look, if that argument was going to work, then we'd have already have seen that opposing part of the yeah. ANC really dying down, mm. die down. And instead, we've actually seen Absolutely. in some way strengthen. Do you think, do you um, think Ramaphosa survives after the... I mean, how long do you think Ramaphosa survives? Obviously, it's impossible to see the future, but... Look, the, let's remember that the next mark um, within ANC politics or the next big event is going to be the National General Council, mm. which will be next year, um, probably around August 2020. Mm. And uh, it is possible at the National General Council for the party to put forward uh, some sort of proposal mm. for him to step down or for t the tide to turn, let's remember that with the National General Council in 2005, mm. the 2005 National General Council, okay. um, after Jacob Zuma had been mm. relieved of his duties uh, as President of the Republic, it became, that's where you started seeing people doing this, the change mm. Sy mm. symbol to Mbegi. Zuma had already built up a huge amount of his own support mm. by that stage. Uh, and that then became the tsunami that, mm. you know, mm. that, that, that led to Bulukwane. And so you could see already uh, what kind of battle was coming mm. in Bulukwane mm. in 2005. Um, and so I would not be surprised if we start seeing um, some, you know, elements of uh, a resurgence against uh, Sir Ramaphosa or an mm. actual effect, an actual attempt uh, to remove him from the presidency yeah. of the ANC in 2020 already. It's going to be a very, very interesting post-election period. And I mean, it seems like all our focus is kind of on what happens immediately in, I guess, on the Sunday after yes. May 8th. But in the weeks and months that follow, it's going to be a fascinating thing to watch. Um, but I wanted to also just pick your brain on opposition politics mm -hmm. as well in South Africa, because we've spoken a lot about the ANC. It's seeming robustness, at least as far as, you know, global comparisons are, are concerned with how, how much of the vote it might garner what do you think of let's let's talk about da and, and eff now what kind of campaign do you think they've they've had and where do you think they sit in our political landscape right now i think that the i think the da really shot itself in the foot with its last year or two years of internal fighting and fighting anti-patent mm. and so it seems to be trying to make up a lot of ground with this election mm. Mm. Um, in terms of putting it out itself out there as a credible uh, governing alternative not just at city level but provincially and nationally um, and but this seem, it seems like we're back to a conversation that the DA was having in 2015 or 2016. And so 
um, because the party's been so caught up in its own um, internal battles mm. uh, for the past two years or so, that it's needing to re-establish itself uh, as not just an opposition party, but as a credible alternative to lead. Mm. And that's and that's a self-created situation. That's a self-created crisis, and I think really unfortunate uh, for for the DA because had it not gone through that process, I think that it would be in a far stronger position um, to really put itself out there as a credible alternative and also an alternative. I think that you know South Africans because of the economic situation, but also because of the rough few years that we've had, are really looking for stability. Um, and the DA's ability to show itself as a stable alternative um, has been compromised. Mm. And so it's it's starting off uh, in some ways from, from, from the back foot. I do think that in at certain at in certain provinces the DA has a uh, a pretty good chance of hmm. um, if not getting in um, completely on its own but certainly going in coalition government I think Gauteng, Northern, Northwest um, Northern Cape are some areas where um, there is no single party that is completely in charge certainly hmm. not in Gauteng hmm. right? you've got two of the biggest metros being, the two biggest metros being mm. run um, by coalitions. Um, and the Ekurleni, where the ANC is in power, you know, is also mm. in coalition there. It's actually going to be interesting to watch what the cities do, even though this is not a local election. I'm be very interested to see what the Joburg results are, the Pretoria results exactly. are, Tswane, um, Nelson Mandela Bay, because... That should be quite fascinating to watch for 2021 as well. Exactly. So that in some ways, I think that you may almost be seeing, you could look at this as a referendum almost mm. on, on city mm. governance mm. Um, and and how people are thinking of it. So, mm. and then with the EFF, yep. I think that the EFF has done really well in posing itself as, or in posing itself as presenting an alternative vision for the country. Mm. Uh, so a different South Africa altogether, right? Uh, in terms of difference in, in property rights, in, um, in the way in which uh, public officials relate to citizens, um, in completely different policy proposals. Um, but I think that the EFF remains very much a Malema party mm. um, and which raises all sorts of concerns about sort of personality cult and, and other things. And, you know, you, even you see it with all the... Um, the posters that say son of the soil. I mean, that's definitely... That's personalised... Um, that's the party personalized in the in the person of the leader. Um, and what that then means about the EFF's broader p popularity, so people who are fans and um, who believe in Julius Malema as the person, no-brainer that they're going to vote for the EFF. Mm. But what does that mean in terms of the broader swathe of people that like what some of what the EFF has to say, uh, that would like the EFF as an alternative to as an alternative opposition party to vote for um, than let's say the DA, but aren't quite either don't particularly like Juju himself or aren't quite comfortable with um, with the amount of power that he has. Um, you know, is that a turn off uh, for them? And I think that it perhaps is one of the things that's going to make the EFF is certainly going to grow in this election, but I don't think will grow to the size of being the op official opposition, for example, um, because its appeal is still so limited to people 
um, who support Julius Malema and the broader leadership cohort mm -hmm. of, of, of the EFF. And what the EFF stands for more broadly, I think, is lost in, uh, within that. Uh, and what that's allowed for is that it's allowed for a lot of... Um, of, of campaigning against, so the parties that are campaigning against the EFF, but then also uh, political commentators or media that don't like the, the, the EFF to focus on Julius Malema the person. Mm. So, you know, whether you're painting Julius as a demagogue or you're painting him as mm. a potential, um, you know, Hitler in the making, or you're so that the fortunes and the um, um, success of the EFF all linked mm. to this okay. person. Um, and I wonder what the EFF will do after this election in terms of establishing itself as a political party, um, whether it'll be able to escape that kind of personification. Well, I want to take up some of those questions yes. in the next parts of this conversation. Great. But thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for, so much for joining us again on SMWX. And remember to spread the fire. SMWX. No young people are around the decision-making table. Let some new voices come to the fore. Follow us on WhatsApp and catch us live Tuesdays and Thursdays. Out with the old, in with the new. SMWX.